how to stop procrastinating. Can, can I make a request? Can I, can I do this lesson? Can I teach this subject next Sunday, please? Can I postpone? I teach you. There's something in my heart. Can I just postpone this? Those are postponers. We are not going to procrastinate. <laughs> we are not procrastinating the message. So how to stop procrastination? Let me begin by saying this. God is a God of now. The God we serve is the God of now. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6.2, For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. God is a God of now. This may be the only signal you will ever receive from God to launch that dream, that project, that ministry, that business. This may be the only signal you will ever receive that God's time of favor is now. You know, for the elite professionals like you listening to me today, continuous learning has become the new procrastination. People are always on self-improvement and self-development. Let me challenge you, beloved of God. This world is not ruled by smarters. This world is ruled by starters. The main difference between the successful people and the rest is basically not knowledge, but action. I have seen people who are very knowledgeable, but they have done very little in their lives. And the difference is who takes action. That's why you have heard me say many times, you better be a hot mess in action than a perfectly organized coward. You would rather make mistakes on the move so long as you're directional than sit down encouraging yourself on your couch that you're waiting on God. The God we serve is a progressive God. Deuteronomy 1, 6 to 8. The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country to the land of the Canaanites. See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. God himself is charging the children of Israel. You have stayed long enough at this mountain. I don't know whether God is speaking to you right now. You have stayed long enough in this valley of decision. Break, come, and advance to the promise. There are many unfamiliar giants between you and the Lord of promise. But God is saying, go in and take possession. Why? This is a promise I gave you on earth. I swore that my people will be blessed. But they are not making progress. The Bible says God will bless the work of our hands. But there is no work to be blessed. When God makes progress, he closes down the previous taps. The place where you are camping, he closes down provisions. You go through dry season because God hates stagnation. God is a God of progress. And God wants progress now. Tomorrow's voice is from the enemy. The only day you have is now. The moment you talk about another time, you are acting like you take charge of your life, like you're in control of your life. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day. Today is the day of God's favor. 
Now, this morning, I only want to speak to people who need to and want to do the assignment. I don't want to talk to people who are refusing to submit the report in rebellion to their supervisor. Those ones I can't help. There are people, for whatever reason, they do not want to submit to their boss that assignment. I, I, my focus is those people who are interested in doing it, but they are postponing it. They need to, and they want to. I recognize that our personalities do affect how we behave, how we act, how decisive we are. I have taught about four personality colors. I encourage you after today, after this service, go to my YouTube channel, Dr. K and Jacob. I have over seven videos on personality types, red people, yellow people, blue people, and green people. And I do not want to touch that right now. I want to focus on procrastination irrespective of your personality type. There are reasons why people of all personalities procrastinate. There may be many reasons. Make no mistake, I am not suggesting my list is exhaustive. There are stacks of books written on this subject. There is so much you can read from different scholars. But I singled out what I felt convicted in my heart are three top reasons why people procrastinate and I'm going to suggest ways to avoid the traps of these three reasons why people procrastinate. Number one on my list is distractions. Distractions. And I want to give you some three F's. Three F's that cause distraction. I think by now, you realize I threw some things on the screen to catch your attention. Hmm. FC in church? Yes. Okay, good. Now I have your attention. Fun, fame, focus. There are people who are distracted by fun. They work online, and when a joke pops up on their screen, they begin to pursue that joke, that storyline, that video, that fun, that picture. And immediately they can't focus on what they were doing. They are fun people. Fun is good. But don't mix work with fun. Work is too serious to mix with fun. There are people who love fame. They love being popular. They love impressing people. They overburden their back. They overcommit. They want to impress everyone. So they try to solve the problem of everyone around them. I challenge you, if you are a victim of popularity, the world does not need another savior. Then we have a third category of people who just lose focus. What is focus? My definition of focus. The ability to say no. Many good options available on the table. Not everything is meant for you to pick. There are many career options. Many men who may love you, many women who may love you, but you can't entertain too many friends. At most, you may only have three healthy friends around you. I mean true, genuine friends. You can't keep a barrage, a baggage of people around you, and you're trying to impress all of them. Learn to say no. If you're invited for three birthday parties the same evening, my suggestion to you, Say yes to the one who invited you earliest. Say no to the others, even if they are closer to you. In our anniversary, on 1st of August, a pastor friend of mine, I invited him to come here. And then he said he's going to do a technical appearance for about 15 minutes because the same day he has been invited by two other churches. And he wants, we are all his friends. I told him, let me help you out. You don't have to come to our church. You don't need to stress yourself like that. To be everywhere is to be nowhere. You will not have attended any church anniversary if you're doing that. If you plan to go to somebody's wedding, I plead with you, 
Go from the beginning to the grace. Close every other subject. You will stress yourself and stress others. I have a friend of mine. I, I'm not sure whether he's a friend. Let me say someone I know. He's a pastor. He's a pastor. And I remember one day he was trying to officiate three weddings. Eventually, he frustrated the three couples. Learn to say no. You don't have to pick every assignment. It's okay to tell me, Pastor, I'm in college. I will not make it for the Wednesday Bible study. Look at the way Jesus used to behave. Our ultimate example. Luke 4, 42 to 44. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him. And when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns. Two, because that is why I was sent. So he continued to travel around, preaching in the synagogues throughout Judea. Now, Jesus healed all the sick in Capernaum, and they wanted him to stay. He was doing a good job. But he said, no, I have to go to the other cities. And because he had the capacity to say no, verse 44 says, he preached throughout Judea. Remember, Israel was divided into two countries that time. The northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judea. His ability to say no helped him to reach the entire country. And I'm inviting you today to a place where you can say no. Learn to say no. Jesus never wasted time. Let, let me invite you to reflect on Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We are not going to read the whole of it, but let me just show you how Jesus operated with a sense of urgency. Just look at this. A few verses from only one chapter in the Bible. Verse 10. And straight away, Coming out of the water after baptism. Straight way means immediately. Look at verse 12. And immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. The spirit of God also operates with a sense of urgency. Verse 18. And straight away they forsook their nets when he caught Peter and Andrew his brother. Verse 20. And straight away he called them and they left their father. This is John and James. Verse 21, and straight away on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue. Verse 28, and immediately his fame spread around. The Spirit of God spread the fame of Jesus with a sense of urgency. Verse 29, and forthwith, which means immediately, and forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue. Verse 31, and immediately the fever left her. When Jesus prayed for the sick, he never deferred the healing to another day. The sick were healed immediately. This was Simon Peter's mother-in-law, verse 31. Verse 42, immediately the leprosy departed from him. That's a leper. He didn't negotiate with sicknesses immediately. Verse 43, and forthwith sent him away. He told the leper, go sh show yourself to the priest and give what Moses commanded when you get cleansed. Well, we may argue this was John Mark's writing style, which is partially true. Nonetheless, when you go through all the four Gospels, you will realize the sense of urgency in which Jesus operated. The second reason why people postpone perfectionism. Perfectionism. And the, the key word here is fear. Fear. We fear mistakes. We fear criticism. We fear to fail. We fear making mistakes. So what do we do? We hide under perfectionism. You know me, 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 I never do it until I get it right. I don't believe in messing up things. I like things when they are so ordinary, so organized. I like getting it perfect. Who told you you are ever perfect? You are never. Perfectionism is not a way of avoiding shame. It's a form of shame. 
Never imagine you attain perfection. No one gets it right the first time except God. So the first fear, the fear of mistakes. I'm telling you today, make no mistakes, you will make mistakes. To make mistakes is to be human. Secondly, the fear of criticism. <laughs> what I've realized, I, I share articles on social media every day. It doesn't matter how much I encourage people, someone will see a problem with the article. They will still throw mud at me. It doesn't matter what I do. So if you're trying to impress people, you'll be a candidate for antidepressants. You'll be on depressants your entire lifetime. There are some people, they drive, they, 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 they vent. The only way to deal with their anger and their frustrations and bitterness is to throw stones at you. Your success reminds them of their failure. Fiona and Ronald, you saw what happened with your wedding pictures. Why? Because your wedding reminds someone else they have lacked a husband. There are some people, every time you succeed, they think you have taken away their portion. There is a law in economics invented by the devil. You gain a dollar by someone else losing a dollar. And it's proved wrong over the time. You don't have to lose a dollar for someone else to gain. He doesn't have to lose for you to gain. When Mark Zuckerberg became a millionaire, a billionaire through Facebook, tell me who lost money. You know, the classical economist economics have been charged over the years. And we have now come to realize we can continually expand the cake. We can continually grow the economy. That notion someone has to lose for me to gain has no place in modern society. And the third fear is the fear to fail. The fact remains you will fail from time to time. Not if you fail, but when you fail. Come to terms with failure. If you do not want to fail a project, you will never launch any. I do know without a shred of doubt, most great projects and great businesses are sacrificed at the altar of procrastination. We substitute results with excuses. Can I ask you, am I talking to myself? Have you found people who keep saying, I like, I like getting it right. If I don't get it right, I don't do it. Or could you be the victim? Ask the best musicians. I've read success stories and biographies from all sectors of our economy. The greatest of the musicians, they will always say there was a wrong, something didn't go right with the performance. The best of the preachers will tell you. Ask me, I'll tell you. I've spoken almost every week for the last 20 years. There is no message that goes exactly as planned. Ask anyone who is doing anything. Nothing goes by the script completely, not even the Hollywood movies. Nothing follows the script completely if it's on live stage. If you're stage managing it and doing a production, that's a different thing. Because you can shoot a second time and at that time. But you know, your life is a final performance. You're not on an acting stage. You're on a final performance. So there will be mistakes from time to time. Focus on the results you can get rather than justifying why you didn't start, rather than explaining yourself too much. Let your results speak for themselves. Now, the Bible speaks about that. Ecclesiastes 11, 4 to 6. Whoever watches the weed will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the path of the weed, or how the body is formed in a mother's womb. So you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. So you sit in the morning, and at evening, let your hands not be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether they saw that, or whether both 
it will do equally well. Now, I find this strange to be in scriptures. How, how can the Bible, how can the God of the Bible tell us there's a probability one will succeed and another one will not? Look at verse 6 again. So you sit in the morning and at the evening let your hands not be idle. Isn't this man of God telling us, if you're selling insurance, knock another door and another door. You do not know who will be your customer. If you're writing books, write another one and another one. You really don't know what will be the hit. If you're producing music, sing another one and another one. You really don't know what will hit in the marketplace. This is in the scriptures. So you moving to the next one and the next one is not a lack of faith. Now, he begins by saying this. If you're not going to plant because you're studying the weed, you're studying the weather, you want to see whether it's going to rain, you're going to wait until the first drop of rain. Then you're too late in sowing. During the sowing season, you better sow. And don't just sow sparingly. Sow in the morning, sow in the evening. Keep doing it. Just think about any career you know, like realtors who sell houses. And study. Ask them a question. Sit down with them. I have done that personally. I sat down with some eight very successful people, four men, four women. And I compiled their stories into a book I called You Don't Need a Job way back 2015. I've done again this year with a couple of people. And I can guarantee you, if you see it with any successful person, let's say, for example, the guys who sell houses, the realtors, they will tell you how they used different methods, the internet, calling, going to people's homes, sending to your mailbox, their flyers, their brochures, and they will not do to one house. They would visit a thousand houses. Most people who are struggling in their finances visited 10 customers and got satisfied. The people who are doing exceptionally well realized that they need to visit another one and another one every single day, many of them. You could be waiting on God and God is waiting on you. He's waiting on you to move. The third reason why people procrastinate is stress. Stress. And primarily, stress is caused by three things. By the way, let, let me make a disclaimer here. There are very, very many causes of stress. What I'm discussing is in respect to our subject of procrastination only. So matters procrastination, there are three things I think stress you on a day-to-day -day basis. Indecision, disorganization, impulsiveness. One, indecision. It doesn't matter what we are discussing, whether it's relationships, investments. So long as you're indecisive, you'd rather make a mistake with the wrong investment scheme. The pain of not investing is much more than the wrong investment. 20 years from now, you will not regret mistakes you made. You will regret what you never did. Every time you're in the valley of decision, should I marry or not? Should I start business or not? Should I, should I not? It's a very painful place to be. It causes stress. Do I continue with this friend or do I drop him? That's a very stressful position. The moment you make up your mind, to stay with that friend, you work out your relationship. The moment you make up your mind to drop that, you free yourself. But whenever you're in the valley of decision, you are always exposing yourself to unnecessary stress. Should I go to church or not? Should I be a member of family church or not? Imagine every single day you have to make decisions. And I'm saying this, you'd rather sometimes make mistakes with your decisions but be decisive. Be decisive. When, when I met Jenna for the first time, and we were having a conversation, and it was a very interesting conversation, and she shared with me her vision for Africa, how she's passionate. 
The next moment I said, when do you want to go? And, and, and th that's the way I operate. When do you want to go? Can we put a date? Let's go. That's how it works. Why? Anything else will continue to stress you. Ask Fiona. When she was telling me about a wedding, I said, when? Let's not discuss things a big city. When? When you put a date on it, it works. Does that make sense? Yeah. By the way, I, I hope I didn't offend Jenna, but that's exactly how she's going to Kenya next week. Because we sat down and she's saying, I want this project. And, and I didn't know she would be in church today. And I say, look, put a date. I know where you can go. I have pastors. Here's the ticket. What other thing do you need? Close the chapter. There, Ed, then. Because we mess up our lives in the valley of decision. Number two, disorganization. If your desk is cluttered, you don't know where to begin. Learn to organize your desk. Learn to make your bed, especially men. Do you know for me, can I surprise you? When I'm praying in our bedroom, if the bed is not made, I can't even pray. I feel like God can't even come. Uh, seriously. I will not get into prayer in a chaotic place. Let's put some order, then I'm able to kneel down and pray. I just don't want to invite God into chaos. When you have all sorts of papers on your desk, your brain gets cluttered. So learn to declutter. Learn to tidy up. You may not believe me. Talk with educationists like Dr. Mary. She will tell you there's a clear relationship between students who are organized and their performance. A clear correlation. I, I get amazed at my son Zig. If you go to his desk, I even feel embarrassed. Even a tiny paper cannot be found there. And the same is true for his grades. Asters. There's a relationship. Trust me. Just get organized. Plan what you're going to do today, the night before. Write a list, and when you wake up, stick to that list. Don't turn to the right or to the left. If you did not identify it last night, it's not important for you. Plan every week the weekend before. Don't allow people to take advantage of you. Retrain your friends and family. Lack of planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. Let me tell you, in my last 10 years, you know there is, there, there is no class of people that is taken advantage of more than pastors. Can I surprise you? In the last 10 years, nobody, not in this church, not anywhere I have ministered, nobody has taken advantage of my time. Nobody. Everywhere I have lived, I think I have made it very clear to people, I will not get into your emergencies. If you're doing your wedding, you already know it. Plan yourself. Don't put pressure on me. Lack of planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. Organize yourself. I had to retrain my parents what I'm telling you the hard way because they come from that old school of thought how children should honor their parents. That's true, but that doesn't mean you disorganize my life. You have brains. Plan. And I'm asking you right now, don't let people mess up with your program. If they didn't invite you in time, be comfortable telling them, no. Be comfortable. I like that. Be comfortable. And then impulsiveness, doing things arbitrarily, haphazardly, running up and about like a headless chicken with no direction. This is a great cause of stress. Doing things randomly. You are not a research item. To do stuff randomly. I'm telling you, just be clearly directional. Be directional in whatever you do. Systemic from this project follows this project. Every time you operate impromptuary, if I may say that, autopilot, whatever comes to me. I have seen this. I have seen a woman. She's replying an urgent email. She's boiling milk. She's on phone. She's ironing clothes because she has to leave the house immediately. 
all at the same time. Before long, the milk has spilled over. She has messed up with her new outfit. The temperatures were built. And she is on phone. And by the way, she's taking care of her baby. The baby is frustrated. The baby is crying. She has stressed herself and stressing everyone else. Then she has to overspeed to reach work on time. And then she's given a ticket. One mess leads to another, and eventually you are full of stress. Is that familiar somewhere? Don't do things randomly, arbitrarily. Be organized. God is a God of order. Study the creation story and realize on the sixth day, he created man and the animals. Man was the last. Before the animals were created, the plants had been created. Study the creation story. God begins by saying, let there be light. Before we discuss anything else, the first thing we need, we need to see what we are doing. There was a clear order. The sun had to be created before animals were there. There was a very clear order. God is a God of order and his children need to be orderly, not impulsive. Including how you buy. When you go to the supermarket, this is not for men. This is for women only. Remember, God created supermarkets for women. I'm challenging you right now. Don't pick anything you just come across. Learn to delay gratification. You don't have to satisfy every appetite, every moment. Self-control is a gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about controlling your buying of clothes. Control the shopping. Control what you buy. And go back to your wardrobe. If there is an outfit you have not used for the last six months, please give me, I give Gina to take them to Kenya. There are some people who need the clothes. If you have not used it for six months and it is a summer dress, you don't need it. You don't need it. We get overwhelmed by tasks. And this leads to stress. Let me suggest something. I don't know whether this will make sense to you. Let me give you a very, an example. This is for ladies only. Men, don't worry about this. This is for ladies only. Let's assume, ladies, you want to do 100 squats the next six months. If you decide that's your goal because you want to strengthen your back, sorry, I'm picking this example because I see Mercy doing that. She tells me she wants to farm her. Yeah. So I think this is a goal with many ladies, if I'm not wrong. If this is your goal, and you say you're going to farm up your back in the next six months, chances are very high before Sunday you will not have started. But if you say you're going to do it for seven days only, seven days only, and you're only going to do 50 in the morning, 50 in the evening. I know I'm not doing well, but it's just illustration. One, two, <coughs> three. And you do it in the morning, maybe 50, and you do it in the evening, 50. And you say, I'm only doing for seven days, only. Then next Sunday, you reward yourself by renewing the covenant. I have made a covenant with myself for the next seven days. It becomes doable. If you have a large assignment, the students listening to me here, if you've gone back to school and you decide you're going to read now for five hours, this thing has to get into your head, you will be stressed. If, however, you decide you're going to focus for the next 25 minutes, you'll be surprised you will end up going for 40. Every time we set achievable, realistic, small goals that are clearly measurable, we get motivated and inspired to pursue them. When a goal is too large, too way out of sight, we get discouraged from starting. So if on your exercises you decide a maximum of seven days, then you renew that target. Then you renew it. You'll be surprised it becomes your new norm, your new normal, your new lifestyle. So I'm suggesting break your tasks into achievable activities within very short time frames. And stop cheating yourself that you can multitask. Focus on one item at a go. 
and give it your all. If it is worth postponing, it's worth abandoning altogether. It's not worth your time at all. So decide this is what is important today and give it your all until you finish. Apparently, the Bible calls us to be gentle and composed, not to be all over, emotional, chaotic, impulsive, and random. Philippians 4, 5 to 6, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Let your gentleness, your calmness, your composure be evident to all. Let anyone who sees you see your composure. Let them see it. In other words, as a believer, never ever look like you've lost control. Jesus had a sense of urgency, but he never once operated at the emergency. Never. Even when he spoke about the death of his friend, Lazarus, he actually told the disciples, our friend Lazarus is asleep. He took time. He knew Lazarus is dead. Four days. He finished what he was doing there. He never operated at the emergency. If you find yourself with urgent stuff to do, you're compromising the important stuff. You need to be more organized. My people perish due to lack of knowledge. Be gentle. Let your calmness and composure be clear in your place of work, at home. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Let them see it with your naked eye. Let them see you're composed. You don't act emotionally. So don't be anxious. Relax. Can I surprise you? This is what I realized. If you ever find people who walk very, very, very fast, or people who walk very, very slow, both of them have a problem. <laughs> people who walk very, 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 very fast, they are disorganized. They just didn't organize their day, and they are trying to make up. And it's the same thing about people who drive very, very fast, or those who drive very slow. Both of them have a problem. If it's written the speed limit is 55, be around 55 if you're normal. If you find yourself doing at 30, you are such a nidra. If you find yourself hitting 90 when it's supposed to be 55, you're trying to make up for oversleeping for lost time. So the Bible is saying be composed. Let, let people not get confused with your driving speed or your walking speed. I meet you in Alana City and I see the way you are walking. Check it, and then I say, brother, what have you smoked today? Slow down. Part in short, I leave you with this word. Don't seek to get more done, but to have less to do. I know that's unconventional. The more I try to study successful people like Warren Buffett, the more I come to this conclusion. Less is more. You achieve more by doing less. Get to be sure this is the reason for my existence. This is the purpose God wants me to pursue and focus on that. Every great name, you don't know them by a million projects. You know them by one project. Every time you hear the name Mark Zuckerberg, you hear Facebook. Every time you hear the name Bill Gates, you hear Microsoft. Every time you hear the name Jeff Bezos, you hear Amazon. The people who do less accomplish more. And that's what I'm suggesting to you. If you find yourself with a million activities, I guarantee you, you will achieve very little. So I'm calling you to a paradigm shift. Don't seek to get more done because you end up not doing it. But to have less to do. If you're able to have a list of items and you realize you only have two things to do tomorrow, at most three, then you're getting somewhere. If you list down what you're supposed to do tomorrow, and you realize your list is hitting 30 items, 40 items, come for coaching urgently. 
If you're following me on Facebook and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6 2, this is your day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. This is your hour. Tomorrow may be too late. Come, come, come to Jesus. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ, I receive you in my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, please write to me on this Facebook Live or write as a comment on YouTube. I prayed to be saved. I'll reach out to you and share with you some materials to help you grow in your Christian walk.